Amen. All right, good morning, church. Uh, we are in 1 Samuel chapter 25 this morning. I want to tell you, go ahead and buckle up. Keep your hands and feet in the right at all times. We have 43 verses to go through. So, so we are 1 Samuel 25, starting in verse 2. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent 10 young men, and David said to the young men, Go to Carmel and go to, Dave, to Na, uh, Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be with you. Uh, peace be to you and, be, and peace be to your house. And peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us and we did them no harm. And they missed nothing at all uh, there in Carmel. Ask your young men and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at your hand to your servants and to your son, David. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and, they, and, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and... My meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to uh, men who come from I do not know where. So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, every man strap on his sword. And every man of them and every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword and about 400 men went up after David while 200 remained with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out to the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we went with them. There were, they were a wall to us both by night and by day, and all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know this and consider what you should do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his house. And he is such a worthless man that no one cannot or that that one cannot speak to him. So then verse 18, then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five shares of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, go on before me, before, behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And as she rode on the donkey and came down under cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her and she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain I have guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face, and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow, Nabal, for he is, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord is, has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this, <clears throat> let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. 
Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of the sling. And when the Lord has done and when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or, pain, or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause for my Lord, working salvation within himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you, who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from work in salvation with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to me, truly by morning there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. Then, David's, then David received from her hand what she had brought him. And he said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice and I have granted your petition. And Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until morning or until morning light. In the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things and his heart died within him. And he became as a stone. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I receive at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to you to take you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey, and her five young women attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took, uh, David also took Ahinoam of, Je of Jezreel, and both of them became his wives. Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Paltai, the son of Laish, who was in Galam. That is the word of the Lord. I feel like I need a break right after that. <clears throat> so last week was one verse. Uh, this week is 43 verses. And uh, I told you it's, it's always a challenge to preach the word of God. As I looked at this uh, story here, I, I felt like I had to cover the whole story all in one sermon because it was pointing to something very important that we must consider as we live and breathe. And the, and, and the fact is, is that God is, is sovereign. Uh, God is working things out through his providence and he does things in specific ways. And sometimes uh, God restrains us for our own good. But before I get there, I want to start off with the fact that God is good, right? If, if, um, if you, if you say that phrase in front of other Christians, especially if you say that phrase in front of Baptists, you say God is good all the time, right? I don't have to even remind you that that's the phrase. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Um, just as God is holy, just as God is love, he is the essence of good. In fact, he defines what good is. So if God does it, it is good. And he is the only perfect expression of it. We could say we are good, but if it's related to God or compared to God and it doesn't match up, then we have to admit that God is good and we are not. So if we are not good, uh, then there is an issue, right? Because on, on the other hand, we are sometimes not good. Uh, the Bible says that we are born bad and in order to be good, we have to be born again. And even after we are born again, there are times when we sin and we are not as good as God. Uh, even when we are good, it's because we have God, right? So it's all related to the Lord. So even after rebirth, 
we are engaged, and I mean uh, rebirth as in spiritual rebirth, we are engaged in a lifelong battle with the flesh. And we are engaged in this battle to wander back to our sin, to wander back to the dark side. Uh, there is something in us that wants to go back from time, to t- from time to time, and we have to remind ourselves that we're not that person anymore, that we belong to the Lord, and this is where we need to stay. But our heart wants what our heart wants, and it, that's why it is a battle. So no matter who you are or how long you have been a Christian, your heart is prone to wander from the goodness of God, and we have to protect our hearts. We have to protect our minds. That's why the Bible tells us that we must suit up, that we must put on the armor of God. It requires us to be actively involved in our sanctification. We are not robots where it just automatically happens. We are involved in that. We are involved in our spiritual growth. So we must suit up, we must arm up, and we must be ready for this fight. But sometimes the urge to want to go back to your sinful ways is so strong That you must rely on God to keep you from going back. Because if it it were up to you, you would go back to your sin. Like a dog goes back to his vomit, you would go back to your sin. You would go back to your sin. You'd go back to doing that for whatever reason. But God keeps us away from it. God keeps us in his good graces. Even though our minds are set on sin, God keeps us in his good graces. See, just as God is actively causing good works in you, because we as Christians, we understand that. We understand that when we do good, it's because God's spirit is working in us to cause this goodness to come out of us. So just like when God actively causes good works in you, he also restrains you from sinning. And both are vital for spiritual growth. If you just take a moment and think about the things that God has prevented you from doing or the things that God has taken away from you, even if it's sinful or not, these things that God has taken away, if you look back at that, it's like praise be to the Lord for doing that for me. Because all that has led you to this point in your life right now. There is so much that could have happened. There is so much that you could have done. But the Lord has restrained you. Well, today... We will study a very serious conflict. You can see the conflict as I read it. It's it's very serious. There there are a lot of things that are involved. It's not black and white. It's just, it's very complex, in other words. And we see within this conflict the effectiveness of God's restraining grace. And I want us to apply what we learn from this conflict to our own lives because God's restraining grace is so important to us. Number one, to bring him honor and glory. And then number two, to understand why he does what he does. So let's let's talk about the conflict first and then we'll go from there. The conflict is or causes David's unrighteous anger. Okay, that's that's what we need to know. The conflict is David's unrighteous anger. Now, I could have said the conflict is Nabal and Nabal was part of the conflict. But the issue here uh, concerning the Lord is David's unrighteous anger. So in this story, we basically have a fool and we have a hothead to start off with, okay? Sounds like a joke, but it's not. It's a, it's, it's a story. So the story goes back on David, and he's venturing, hiding in the wilderness from Saul. Uh, this story has nothing to do with Saul, but we're going to make some comparisons here to David and Saul in a minute. David almost makes one of the biggest mistakes in his life here. He's already made several. We know he has several more to make. Uh, but here he almost makes one of the biggest mistakes in his life. While, he's, he is, while he is in the wilderness of Maon, David and his people need supplies. They need supplies and they also need food. And he hears that there is a local wealthy man named Nabal who is uh, basically feasting, who is celebrating. He is shearing his sheep. Uh, when someone sheared their sheep, that was a time of providence, uh, not providence, but profit, a time of, of, of prosperity. Uh, it was a time of plenty, right? Because you're about to, you're about to give in uh, the harvest, and, or not the harvest, but you're about to give, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Can't think of the word. But you're about to give the wool to and sell the wool and get profit from it. 
Uh, so this was a time of planning, a time of celebration. Thank you, by the way, for helping me out. <laughs> David realized that the wealthy man was the same man whose servants he had been protecting all this time in the wilderness. So David realized this is the wealthy man. I've been protecting his servants. I've been providing for them. Uh, surely he's going to help me when I ask for the supplies I need and also for food that I need for us being here in the wilderness. And his kindness to Nabal was not meant with, in kindness. In fact, it was meant in evil, with evil. Uh, the, the thing is, is what David asked of Nabal was completely acceptable, but Nabal was just a foolish man, uh, a, a selfish man. And we can see that in how the, the Bible de depicts uh, his reaction to what David was asking for. Look at verses 7 and 8 of uh, chapter 25. Uh, in verses 7 and 8, uh, the, his men, David's men, uh, go and ask. He says, I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm, and they missed nothing at all this time that they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. Now, I want you to notice something there. He's asking for help, but he's also showing humility. David sends these young men. They are his messengers. They speak for him. And so everything that David does up until this point is good. It's, and what he's asking for is reasonable. Uh, he didn't have to help Nabal's men as they were uh, as they were shepherding the sheep in the wilderness. In fact, Nabal owns his prophet to David for protecting his sheep and also for protecting his shepherds. But Nabal responds harshly to them. Look at verses nine and eleven. When David's young men came, they said to all, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, "Who is David?" Now, first of all. Everybody knew who David was. Saul killed his thousands. David kills his ten thousands, right? It was, uh, they had a song about David. Uh, they, they knew who David was the one who killed Goliath. He was the most famous person there uh, in the land. So he starts off by who is David and who is the son of Jesse? Not only does he uh, offend David, but he also offends his father. And he says, there are many servants these days that are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread? Shall I take my water? Shall I take my meat that I have prepared, that I have killed for my shearers and give it to, I don't even know who this person could be. So Nabal not only denied David his request, but scripture goes on to tell us that he railed against him. When you look at that in the, that, that Hebrew word translated, it means that he screamed at them and that he hurled insults at them. So he publicly um, embarrassed them whenever they came to ask for the supplies and for the food. So it wasn't just like, no, just rejecting them. Uh, he, he did it with malice. Now, nobody was surprised by Nabal's reaction. Why? Because it was who he was. Listen to a couple of verses about his character. First of all, verse 17. One of his servants said this of him. He is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. Now, mind you, when the young man said this, when the young servant said this, he said this in front of his wife and his wife, Nabal's wife, did not correct him. That, that should speak volumes, right? She did not defend her husband's honor. She did not correct him. She accepted it as truth. She accepted it as truth. So that's one thing that is said about Nabal in verse 17. Next, the next thing is said about Nabal in verse 25 comes from his wife, Abigail. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. I almost want to say Nabal is his name and folly is his game. But that's, that's, what, that, that's what she meant. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. See, upon hearing Nabal's response, no one is surprised. On Nabal's, in Nabal's camp. But David, David is surprised and he is infuriated. Look at verse 13. As soon as David hears the news from Nabal, and David said to his men, 
Every man strap on his sword. And then the Bible says every man strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. Now, there are times when you're mad and there's times where you're spitting mad. This is where David is just spitting mad. He's angry at Nabal's response. Nabal's response, it was harsh, no doubt. It was wrong. It was sinful, matter of fact. But when David heard his response, David went automatically to vengeance. He went automatically to this guy deserves to die. And so when he hears a response, he says, everyone strap on your sword. He straps on his own sword and they go in pursuit of Nabal. Now, Nabal's response, as I said before, was harsh, but it was not deserving of death according to the law. Now, one thing we have to note here is where is the restraint that David displayed with Saul? Right. Just a couple weeks ago, we talked about how David restrained not only himself, but his men who wanted to kill Saul. Saul had been given to them as a gift to 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 be slaughtered. And David was restrained by the spirit of God. And also, David had to restrain his men from taking vengeance on Saul. Where is that restraint? It's gone. Here in this picture, as soon as he hears that Nabal is not willing to give David what he asked for, he is ready to take vengeance upon Nabal himself. Now, Saul had committed the greater sin against David. We need to notice that. Saul had been pursuing David this whole time, and yet David was able to restrain himself from killing Saul. That would have been sinful too. Why? Because he was the Lord's anointed. But notice the patience that David has with Saul and the patience he does not have with Nabal. I want to pause right here, and and I want us to think about this because I, I think this is important. Like David, we pick and choose who is to receive our anger and who is to get our mercy. We do this as well, right? Those closest to us, they receive our anger. And those who have authority over us or maybe influence on us, well, a lot of times they receive our grace. Should it be that way? No, it shouldn't. Sometimes we have more patience with our boss than we do our wife or our husband. We're quick, very quick to yell at our kids or yell at our wife or or just get angry right right away. But yet there are people who offend us outside of our family and we show them grace. We show patience. We're loving with them. That is the right thing to do. We should be patient and loving with others, but we should be especially patient and loving with with those who in our same in our in our same household. So we should be careful about picking and choosing. Now, David's anger blinds him and takes him uh, to a a new level. It it takes him to a new level. And he basically takes on the persona of Saul. Like Saul, he is ready to kill. And uh, he's ready to kill because of selfish reasons. Because he has been uh, basically disrespected. It seems to be all about David. Now, this is really this is really neat here because the last three or four weeks we've been talking about how good David was doing. Right. But I warned you, we are not to exalt David. We are to exalt the God who is working in him. Sooner or later, his sin was going to pop up again. And here we are. We are seeing uh, David's anger at 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 um, at <clears throat> at Nabal. We are seeing David's anger at Nabal. Taken, and, and David is taking on the persona of Saul. He's ready to kill Nabal and his people over being disrespected. And, and take note of that. He's not only to kill Nabal, ready to kill Nabal, but he's also ready to kill his people. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 22, when Saul kills the priest of God, why, why is it? Well, it's because of the same type of reasoning. It's because... Saul has been disrespected. It's because Saul has been lied to. It's because he has filled, he feels, he felt betrayed. 
Now, listen to David's reasoning as to why he wants to kill Nabal. Look at verses 21 and 22. Now David said, surely in vain have I guarded all this fellow has in the wilderness. Now notice how that complaint starts. It starts with I. Surely I have guarded all this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. Then he goes on, God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. Yeah, David is angry because Nabal has offended him. He feels unappreciated, and he feels like he's been made to look a fool. His anger is not concerned about God. Rather, it's concerned, it, it, he is concerned about himself. His anger is self-centered, and that's why it is unrighteous. Now, the Bible shows us and tells us that anger is a part of God's character. Anger in itself is not sinful when it is righteous anger. So you and I, we are made in God's image. And if it is a part of God's character, then anger is a part of our character. What angers God should anger us. Sin should anger us, even our own sin. But guess what? It doesn't. Sometimes it does. Many times it doesn't. We are not, many times we are not angry because people offend God, but rather we become angry because they have offended us. It is focus on self. Let me ask you, how often are you angry about what angers God and how often are you angry about what angers you personally? I think that's a very good question for us to ask ourselves. When our anger is righteous and good, we tend to partner it with mercy and grace because we know that we are sinners just like the other person. We know that we sin against God. We have failed God ourselves. If it were not for God's mercy and grace, we would have his wrath upon us. So instead of placing our wrath on others, we understand what they do with mercy and grace. When anger is self-centered, well, it's partnered with vengeance. A lot of times that's how you can tell. Someone gets you angry, so angry that you want to get back at them. That's where you got to stop. You got to stop and you got to say, Wait a second, what am I really mad at? What is fueling my anger? Is it righteous or is it unrighteous? Well, that's what David is doing here. So that's the conflict, but I want us to see how God intervenes. And he intervenes with one of his vessels, Abigail. He uses wisdom to prevail. Now, the good thing for David is that although he was sinful, God God was good. That's why I mentioned that in the very beginning. Although we are sinful, God is good, and God is good all the time. You're going to see that that phrase reoccur here, or that theme reoccur here as we go along. See, God used Nabal's wife Abigail to be the voice of wisdom and also to be the voice of reason for him. And uh, she she was great in this story. not, not, not much is mentioned about Abigail, except that, number one, she was discerning, which means that she was wise, and number two, that she was beautiful. So both of those actions, or her actions actually, completely back up the, the description of her. Not really her beauty, but her discernment and her wisdom. Now, I, I know, ladies, you're sitting here and you're like, I can relate to Abigail, I'm just like her. I'm, I'm beautiful and I'm wise. And, and I, I would agree with you. You're beautiful and you're wise. But we have to be careful about the stereotypes here. We have to be very careful about that because a lot of uh, women will read this passage and they take what they've learned from society and read the passage and come to the conclusion that women are wise and men are foolish. Now, let me explain. Society paints women like Abigail. And when I say society, I mean worldly society. Society paints women like Abigail and men like Nabal. Do you ever see that? Um, 
one good example is, is if you watch Disney Channel at all, and you watch any show related to a, a family, you're going to see the mother who is wise, beautiful, has everything all together. You're going to see the kids who act like adults, and then you're going to see a foolish dad. He doesn't know anything. He can't do anything without his wife, and his kids are always disrespecting him. That's the picture that society paints. And we have to be very careful of that because this story is not about men being foolish and women being wise. This story is about the ability we all have to be foolish. The ability we all have to have unrighteous anger. And also the ability we all have to be the voice of reason. Right? We have to, we have to think about that fact. And we have to know that this is what this story is about. It's, it's not to stereotype positions. It's not to attack uh, the, 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 the family or, or the roles in the family. That's very easily done nowadays. So she is a woman after God's own heart. And there are some things that we should take note of about her. Number one, when the servants of Nabal come to her, she listens. And she responds urgently. I I really like that about her in this passage. There's a complaint about her husband and she doesn't just hear it and say, well, I'll take about I'll take care of it later. Or that's the way he's always he always is. I'm not going to worry about it right now or I'm going to let him take care of it. Eventually, he'll realize he was wrong and he'll go and take care of it. Abigail is seen rushing here and there to fix things. Now, that kind of reminds me. Uh, when, when you look at a fool, a fool rests while others work to fix his mistakes, right? When we make foolish mistakes, we're making more work for someone else. But Abigail was willing to go from place to place, rush from here to there to fix what her husband had done wrong. Also, she shows respect and humility to David. She acknowledges the wrongdoing of her husband, and she even carries the burden of it. When she sees David, she says, it's all on me. It's all on me. And there was a reason behind that. She wanted to be Nabal's spokesperson. Either she was going to receive David's wrath or she was going to be the voice of reason for David. She listens to God over man. Instead of passively waiting for Nabal to see his sin, she takes accountability and seeks repentance. Although her husband was foolish, she also doesn't take out her own vengeance on him. She doesn't seek her own vengeance against him, rather. She leaves it in the hands of the Lord. See, she is doing what a helpmate ought to do. And considering Nabal's character, she probably had to do this often. He was a fool. This is who he was. So here are some lessons about her life and about what she's done. Number one, if you are married, well, if you're married, you can't do anything about this already. But if you're looking to get married, number one, don't marry a fool, right? That's the first thing. And what I mean by that is a fool says there is no, the Bible says a fool says there is no God, right? So that's where we start. Don't, don't marry a person who's not a believer. If you're a believer, don't marry a person who's not a believer. You're not going to change them. Only God changes hearts. But if, if, if you're already there, I'm not saying that your non-believing spouse is a fool. But the thing is, is that we have to be careful who we partner with. Right? We have to be careful. And we also have to take accountability for that when we decide to follow our own desires and marry people who are not Christians. Number two, a helpmate is A selfless calling, not a selfish calling. Notice how this was not 50-50 for Abigail. It probably never was. She had to deal with Nabal the whole time. He was self-centered. He was foolish. He probably treated her harshly. And yet she remained. I think that's a great lesson. Number three, a helpmate doesn't repay evil for evil. She could have easily let Nabal go on 
and receive his due punishment. But yet she was trying to fix things, trying to help her family. Number four, a helpmate is concerned about God over man. For her to go without telling her husband to go and try to fix things. Well, from a society perspective, it would have been wrong in the day for her to do that. But she knew that if she didn't do that, everything would be lost. And she knew that her husband would prevent her from going. So she followed God instead of man. And then number five, a helpmate, uh, fulfill, a helpmate's fulfillment is in the Lord and not their spouse. I think that's also important for us to consider. I doubt that Abigail had any fulfillment in her marriage with Nabal as far as concerning him personally. I'm sure she struggled with a lot of different things. But she found her fulfillment in the Lord and not her spouse. Now, her actions kept David from sinning against the Lord And they brought judgment upon Nabal for his evil ways. See, David would have been guilty of blood guilt, basically murder. And his life would have been required for the life that he took according to the law. So if you were guilty of blood guilt, you would have to be you would have to be killed yourself. Nabal would have remained clueless if it weren't for Abigail. Because after she had her conversation with David, she came back and confronted him with his sin. And then we see that the Lord brought judgment on Nabal. Look at verses 36 through 38. And Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until the morning light in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal. His wife told him these things and his heart died within him and he became as a stone. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. We should all consider the wisdom that Abigail displayed here. It is a good example to follow in our dealings with people, especially within the church. It's important to note that as Abigail was wise, In her dealings, the Lord was gracious with her. And she impressed David so much that after her husband died, he took her to be his wife. So we see how wisdom prevailed over anger. And like if we're watching this as a movie, as a movie, we're kind of clapping our hands. We're like, yes, that's awesome. That's a great ending. But who is really who is to get the credit here? Who gets the glory here? Is it Abigail? No, not at all. Because what we see is that Abigail was God's vessel. See, David recognizes the Lord's hand in sending Abigail to him. Look at verse 32. This is what David says after every after he's able to calm her or after she's able to calm him down. And David said to Abigail, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. See, David was ready to kill Nabal and he was ready to kill all of his household. Just like Saul, when he was angered, he killed the priests and all of their household. He murdered them, innocent people. David was ready to do the same thing. He was not going to leave one person alive. But because of Abigail's wisdom and her presence, that all stopped. And he was preventing, he was prevented from sinning against the Lord. See, God's restraining grace worked through. It's awesome because it worked through Nabal's sin. And what a great sin it was, but it worked through Nabal's sin It used Abigail to be a vessel of reason and good. And it kept David from wrecking his life. See, that's the kind of stuff we don't see on a regular basis. We don't see on a daily basis, or at least we don't recognize it on a daily basis. There are so many times in life that God restrains us and we're clueless to it. But God is good. He restrains us 
so that we don't wreck our lives. See, the Lord had determined that David would take the throne. If David was guilty, or if he had blood guilt on him, that would have prevented him from doing so. So yeah, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. There was a reason and a purpose why David would not be, or could not commit this sin. It would have altered the will of God. And God's will will be accomplished. And so he saved David by restraining him. I want to tell you, the Lord has a plan for your life. I know a lot of times you hear that and people kind of cringe, but it's true. He does have a plan for your life. Don't let the prosperity gospel destroy that verse for you. He's sovereign. He's determined a plan for your life. That's good for us to know. Through providence, he is working in and through you to accomplish the purpose he created you for. Your life has a purpose. It has a definite end. God is working in you. God is working through you to accomplish his will for you. The Bible tells us that he will complete his he will complete his work and he will accomplish what he has created you for. Even if he has to restrain you in order to do that. Now, our response to God restraining us at times is that we must be thankful to the Lord for his restraining grace. Paul says that if not for the Lord, things would be a lot different for us. Listen to this out of first Corinthians chapter 15. Talking about himself, he says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. I have to remind myself of that all the time. If it were not for God, where would I be? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. The same is true for you. Like Paul, you have sinned against God and you deserve the worst. And yet the Lord always provides the best for you. You deserve to be completely given over to your sin and yet He remains merciful to keep you from being depraved. He's the one who keeps you from being the Romans one person. Someone who is completely given over to their sin. They love it. They indulge in it. They're going to die in it. And they're going to suffer the wrath of God because of it. Now I want us to notice something. When you get David and Saul and you Stand them up side by side because now we have a we have a comparison. We have a situation where we can compare them. The only difference between the two is God's spirit. And his restraining grace. Saul was an unbeliever. His God had removed his spirit from him. There was nothing to restrain him from what he did with the priests and their families. God had given him over to his sin, so he committed this great sin, horrible sin. He would pay for that later. Vengeance would be the Lord's. Now with David, he stops him. He stops him from committing the sin. His spirit was the only difference between the two. Now I bring that up because as we look to other people, we might, we might start to think that we are better than they And we are not better than they. We have God's spirit. And it is God who deserves all the credit for the sin that we don't do. It is God who deserves all all the credit for who we are. We can't take any credit because it's by the working of his spirit that we are who we are. So. We must understand that there is a purpose to God's restraining grace. 
And if there's a purpose to it, then number one, we must be engaged in asking for more of God, of God's restraint. Matthew 6, 13, the Lord teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's in the Lord's prayer. That's something that should be on our mind. Lord, I'm going to face some things today that I'm not strong enough to handle. I'm, I'm, I'm too weak to overcome. There are some temptations in my life that if they are presented before me, I'm, a fail, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to fail. So, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but please deliver me from evil each and every day. We need that. But we also need to be sensitive to God, to God's restraint, or we need to be sensitive to God restraining us and seek to understand why. I, I speak to a lot of people, and, and, and sometimes we get into the topic of life, and there's frustrations with life because things aren't just working out the way they want things to work out. And it's like, well, I want this job, but I just I can't seem to get it. I want this person, but I can't seem to convince them to marry me. You know, I, I want this, I want that, I want this, and yet it's just not coming to fruition. We have to understand why. A lot of times it's sinful. We don't share that with anybody. We don't, we don't share that, but we know if we are ever given the opportunity, we would take advantage of it. Well, think about this. Though sin can be forgiven, it can never be undone. It can never be undone. Your sin will hurt you and your sin will hurt someone else. So if God is restraining us from it, we need to understand why. And if, if we learn to understand why, the next step is going to be repentance. Because sometimes if we look at our lives, God's restraint of, of sin is sometimes temporary and then sometimes it's completely permanent. Right, Because there's times where we need help to be able to stand against a certain sin. And we need God restraining us. But then we grow spiritually and we get to the point where, not that we don't need God anymore, but that is no longer a temptation for us. We're able to stand against it. But for a time, we need him to completely restrain us. That restraint should lead us to repentance. We need to be able to see it, be sensitive of it, and notice that, that God is restraining us for a reason, and that reason is for us to repent, to acknowledge that our sin is sin and that we don't need any part of it. And we also need to see that God works through people in our lives to restrain us. Now, this is, this is uh, it's pretty frustrating at times because as I said before, your heart wants what your heart wants. And God puts people in your life to restrain you from evil or something that is not his will for you. And it's amazing the people he uses. He uses your spouse. How infuriating is that sometimes? When your spouse is a voice of reason and you don't want to hear it. He uses your kids. I, I know of a lot of households, when you look at the parents, they'd be divorced if it weren't for their kids. And they admit it. We're only together. I'm only with him because of my kids. Well, God's given you time to repent. To see your husband or to see your wife for who they truly are, a gift from God. To, to fix that marriage, to work on that marriage. The time of mercy and grace. Sometimes those kids are very useful for that. Or the person who's preaching. Many times I'm sure I get on your nerves. Because I'm always up here correcting. Pastor Laramie's always up here correcting, right? We're here to encourage, but we're also here to correct. And that's frustrating at times. Oh, that dude thinks he knows everything. I try to tell you, I'm just like you. I suffer from these sins just like you do. As we prepare sermons for you, we prepare it for ourselves first and foremost. God has the church. 
That's the reason why a lot of people don't want to get close to other people in church. Because it requires to get personal. It requires closeness. It requires people interfering in your life, stopping you from doing what you want to do. God works through all those types of people. See, as we live, move, and breathe, we need to, number one, take every thought captive to the word of God. And number two, we need to know that his restraints for us, that they're good because he is good. And praise God when he restrains us for his honor, for his glory, and our ultimate good. Let us pray.